Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and today we are talking with Dr. Nuruddin Sati, Sudan's ambassador to the United States. We track Sudan closely at El Monitor because we believe it is one of the most compelling and sometimes overlook countries and stories in the region. What we have called the sequel to the Arab Spring may have started in Sudan with popular anti-government demonstrations in December 2018. And those demonstrations eventually led to longtime president and war criminal Omar al-Bashir being replaced by a transitional government led by economist Abdullah Hamdak. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced a, quote, new chapter in U.S.-Sudan relations. With Sudan off the U.S. terrorism list, the IMF and the World Bank are now considering Sudan's application for debt relief under the Enhanced Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative. David Malpass, World Bank Group president, called this possibility a breakthrough adding that the reform steps taken so far by Sudan's government, including arrears clearance and exchange rate unification, could put Sudan, and I'm quoting Mel Pass here, on the path to substantial debt relief, economic revival, and inclusive development. And finally, Sudan, along with Egypt, has called out Ethiopia for the failure of the latest round of negotiations over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, GERD by its acronym. These talks ended in Kinshasa last week with no resolution. And the GERD talks overlap with Sudan's concerns about the violence in Tigray in Ethiopia, where we have seen armed exchanges between Ethiopian and Ethiopian forces and Ethiopian-backed armed groups and Sudanese military. We will discuss all of this today with our guest, Dr. Nuruddin Sati, Sudan's ambassador to the United States, one of his country's most distinguished diplomats. After receiving a doctorate in literature from the University of Paris, Sorbonne, Dr. Sati returned to Sudan to teach French language and literature at the University of Khartoum. In the following year, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of his country and served as Sudan's ambassador to France the Vatican, Portugal, and Switzerland, and then as permanent delegate to UNESCO. In 2002, Sati was appointed United Nations Deputy Special Representative for Burundi, where his mediation helped end the country's civil war. He has served as a member of the High Council for Peace in the Sudan and has been awarded the National Order of the Legion of Honor by the French Republic and the Medal of St. Gregory by the Vatican. In May 2020, Sati was appointed the first Sudanese ambassador to the United States in over 20 years. My conversation with Ambassador Nuruddin Sati begins now. Ambassador Sati, Ramadan Mubarak, and welcome to On the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's get right into it and start with the talks over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, or GERD. Your Prime Minister, Abdullah Hamdak, has called for an urgent summit with Egyptian and Ethiopian counterparts. The last round, mediated by Democratic Republic of the Congo President Felix Tachidi, the current head of the African Union broke down earlier this month without agreement. Ethiopia has since threatened to go ahead with the second filling of the dam, which your country and Egypt oppose. What is Sudan itself looking to achieve at this time? Well, what we are to, trying to achieve, as we has, uh, have said uh, many times, is uh, an uh, agreement uh, binding, uh, fair, and acceptable to all. That's all that we we are looking for uh, under international law. Uh, And uh, I think this is not something which is very, uh, I would say, impossible to achieve if there is uh, the right kind of uh, political will. So that's all that we are asking for, actually. 
And the talks in Kinshasa broke down. What is uh, your prime minister and your country believe that can bring the country, bring the three of you together on an agreement which has so far been elusive? And and why, in in your opinion, has it been so elusive? I mean, what is, what is this stumbling block to an agreement here? Well, we think that the initiative by Prime Minister Hamdouk is timely, and it is within also the DOP that has been signed in 2015. Uh, and um, we think that if there is real political will, uh, our leaders can agree uh, on um, a common uh, position, common understanding, which would be in the interest of the, the three countries and the interests of the uh, region at large. Um, the stumbling box has uh, been, uh, well, the unwillingness of uh, our dear brothers uh, next door in Ethiopia to, uh, to engage in talks that would uh, result in a binding agreement. Uh, that's what has been their position so far. Uh, we hope that um, um, they will reconsider this position. Uh, and see uh, the fact that the girls to which we are not opposed can serve the interests uh, of all, and that it can become uh, a symbol of regional uh, cooperation and integration rather than being a, a cause of conflict. You know, when I uh, spoke with Foreign Minister Shukri and Ambassador Zahran, uh, they made very clear that, uh, you know, any interruption in the water flow from the Nile would have severe effects on Egyptian development and its uh, economy. 95% or thereabouts of Egypt's, Egypt's water comes from the Nile. Are the stakes as high for Sudan and how do you see the GERD affecting your water supply and development? Well, of course, we, it's, uh, well, it has already, we already have the experience of the first filling of last year uh, when uh, Ethiopia started filling without uh, notification or agreement or information sharing. And the result has uh, been there. You know, even I was in Khartoum at that time, and actually the level of the of the water um, has, you know, been reduced considerably by the first filling. And uh, it was felt for uh, about three days in, in Khartoum. The pumps, uh, you know, could not function. And thank God, then there have been uh, rains after that and uh, things have uh, returned to normal. Uh, this time is going to be threefold the, the first filling. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, logically, we would expect uh, to be informed about how this filling is going to be led. and. Uh, um, together, sit down and see what would be the negative impacts on Sudan and, and Egypt. Um, and uh, see to it that this is not going to be repeated in the future. And see to it that each and everybody's rights are con conserved under international law. Mr. Ambassador, have you received, uh, your government received a response yet to the Prime Minister's invitation to his Egyptian and Ethiopian counterparts? Not to my knowledge, but uh, I am personally hoping and we are hoping that there will be an agreement because this is also, this is really a way of the leaders uh, to sit together in order to look uh, into the broader picture and see what are really uh, the rights, what are the interests, what would be our future um, relations in this region and how we can live together uh, in peace and harmony. What can the United States be doing to facilitate the negotiations. Of course, back in 2019, there was a negotiation that was mediated by the US Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, along with the World Bank. And a framework was worked out among the three parties that was acceptable to Egypt, acceptable to Sudan, and seemed to be acceptable to Ethiopia until the last minute when Ethiopia did not agree to sign the paper. Is there a role for the Biden administration to assist, or is this something 
that needs to be worked out between the three parties, perhaps with the AU, and there have been others who have offered to mediate as well. Yeah, the U.S. role has been constructive in the past and it continues to be. Uh, we in Sudan have called for uh, a role for the United States uh, within uh, the quartet that we have been advocating. Uh, and uh, the United States has been very active, actually, as you rightly know, as you know, um, a delegation you know, was sent to the region, which stood the, 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 uh, for uh, Kinshasa, um, Addis Ababa, Cairo, and Khartoum. Uh, and the uh, USC is now, um, to my knowledge, engaged in assessing the situation and see how, what, how they, uh, the role that can, uh, they can play in bringing the, the three countries together. Ambassador, uh, your country's concerns about Ethiopia are not just about the GERD. There have been skirmishes between Sudanese and Ethiopian and Ethiopian-backed forces on the border. I believe Sudan is already hosting about 70,000 refugees from Tigray as a result of the violence over the past six months or so. And just yesterday, the Ethiopian Ministry of Foreign Affairs put the burden and blame on Sudan. And let me just quote from a statement that the ministry put on Twitter that said, Sudan has affected the, now I'm quoting, the peace and security of the Horn of Africa by invading Ethiopian territories, plundering and displacing civilians, and beating war drums to occupy even more lands. How do you respond to that statement? And tell us about Sudan's position on what's happening in, in Tigray. Well, uh, I, I think that this kind of language is not helpful. Well, we need to work for reconciliation and de-escalation. And that's what we are doing in, in Sudan. We have not occupied uh, uh, Ethiopian territory. Uh, we have uh, recovered um, our rightful rights to our uh, borders that have been recognized uh, since the 19th century. Uh, and Sudan has never been uh, an occupying uh, country. Uh, never in the history of Sudan, it has been, you know, um, said that Sudan try, attempted to occupy anybody else's uh, um, land. Or on the contrary, you have been victims of, of, of invasions in the past. So I, I just uh, hope that our brothers and sisters in, in Ethiopia next door uh, will uh, measure their words and uh, uh, and be helpful in finding a compromise. Uh, war between Sudan and Ethiopia is not a natural development in the relations with the countries. We should be now talking about integration rather than, 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 than war. Uh, our two people are, you know, friendly people, are loving people. We appreciate Ethiopians, Ethiopians appreciate Sudanese. And I think within, it's within this uh, uh, spirit that we seek solutions to our problems. As to the problem with Tigray, I do not want to delve into in internal politics of Ethiopia. The only thing I say, I wish them to stop uh, the war uh, and embark uh, in uh, reconciliation for their country. And they have helped us in order to resolve our problems a couple of times in our recent history. All that we hope for is for Ethiopia to call on us, help them also resolve their problems. They have not done that so. This, 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 they are a sovereign country. They have their own choices. We wish them well, and we wish uh, peace and stability for this year. I think it would be fair to say, if you agree, that given the negotiations over, over the GERD, uh, the situation uh, on the border of, of Ethiopia, including the refugee crisis uh, that continues, uh, that uh, there's a high risk of escalation if uh, the diplomatic process doesn't pick up? Well, you know, um, I have been working on issues of peace and reconciliation uh, in the region for the last 22 years. Uh, not, even, not to mention the, the over 40 years that I have been engaged in diplomacy. Uh, and um, my remark is that whenever you have refugees from a neighboring countries, um, you have to be very careful about managing, uh, you know, the situation, uh, work for de-escalation so as not to, um, you know, um, 
uh, exacerbates the situation so that at the end of the day, the refugee phenomena does not turn into self, itself in something else. And we have seen this for too long uh, on our eastern borders. We, we do not want the situation to, uh, to be renewed again. Your relations with Egypt since former President Bashir was deposed are stronger than ever, including joint military exercises this month. Some see the military cooperation and the deepening ties as a signal to Ethiopia. Is it fair to say that Ethiopia has helped bring Sudan and Egypt closer together? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Egypt and Sudan have had a couple of attempts of integration in the past, even since the 50s, actually, and uh, and the 70s. Uh, We have worked for integration between Sudan and Egypt, and I think what's happening today is a is a development in the in the relations of the two countries, which feel that they have common objectives, they have common interests, and uh, they are working for the welfare of their uh, of their two peoples. We talked a little about the U.S. role or potential role in um, in the GERD. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken has referred to what he calls a new chapter in U.S.-Sudan relations following your country's payment of $335 million related to claims from lawsuits from U.S. families affected by al-Qaeda actions in Africa back in the late 1990s. You are the first Sudanese ambassador here in Washington in 20 years. This is indeed a, a new chapter for U.S.-Sudan relations, is it not? Uh, certainly, it is certainly a new chapter. Uh, after you know hostility that continued for 30 years, we are now opening a new chapter in which the two countries are working for full normalization of relations and uh, building partnerships uh, uh, in all uh, aspects uh, of life, uh, whether it's the political uh, coordination, uh, economic uh, and trade uh, uh, relations, uh, uh, security uh, relations, and and we are really working very actively in order to see to it that uh, the, the relations between our two countries are uh, built on solid basis, uh, so that we are going to have a sustainable relation of partnership, cooperation, uh, and friendship. I mentioned in the introduction that David Malpass, the World Bank president, called the decision of the IMF and the World Bank to consider Sudan's application for debt relief under the enhanced heavily indebted poor countries initiative, and I'm using Malpass's word, a breakthrough. An IMF report on Sudan recently was complimentary of Sudan's progress so far with reforms while noting that, you know, the progress is fragile and there's still a long way to go, but significant progress nonetheless. What are the most difficult challenges for Sudan in implementing these reforms in order to benefit from the initiative uh, of the IMF and the World Bank on debt relief? Well, to my mind, um, those obstacles, the major ones are the fact that uh, Sudan has to uh, relearn working with the international financial and monetary system. Uh, we have been uh, excluded from that system for so long. Uh, the former regime adopted um, thing, ways of doing things uh, uh, were not conducive, you know, to cooperation with the international system. And uh, now we are rebuilding our uh, capacities within the country uh, in order to be in line with the requirements of the international uh, financial system. Uh, this includes. Uh, uh, deep reforms uh, in the banking sector, uh, creating conducive envi- environment for investment, um, relearning to work with international uh, investors, especially from the Western world, that have, most of them have been abs- abs- absent for them many years. So in a nutshell, I think uh, rebuilding internal capacity in order to be able to receive uh, investments uh, from abroad. Uh, and uh, being able to invest uh, and capitalize uh, on our stronger uh, points of the economy, uh, including uh, agriculture, uh, including energy, including um, technology, IT, uh, education, uh, and creating jobs 
uh, for our uh, younger generation, uh, and of course, rebuilding the areas that have been affected by war for so long. And you are optimistic, I would think, at this point. I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic because uh, uh, Sudan is in a completely different, different, I would say, mindset and trajectory for the time being, uh, where the, the people, uh, the young women in Sudan are looking for the future with renewed uh, energy and determination. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we are going to make it. Sudan has recently repealed the 1958 boycott. Next week, it's been announced that the first official Sudanese delegation will visit Israel. How does relations with Israel fit into Sudan's foreign policy? And do you see economic benefits of the relationship as well? Yeah, we have uh, signed an MOU um, uh, to work um, with the Abraham Accord. We have not fully normalized relations yet. We are talking about normalization and looking at uh, ways and means of uh, of achieving it, bearing in mind our complex political situation. Um, But we are looking forward. uh, uh, This fits actually within uh, our renewed foreign policy uh, structure uh, in which we look uh, at, uh, at peace, uh, um, reconciliation uh, and stability uh, in uh, the broader region in which Sudan can play a role uh, to, in order to be a pacificator uh, rather than a, trouble, a troublemaker, as has, this has happened throughout the last 30 years, uh, and that we are a trusted and respected partner in the region and in the world at large. And that we look into our own um, interests, pursuing Sudan's interests and doing what it is in Sudan's interest. Uh, And I think that for so long, we have not been doing that necessarily. So now it's about time that we look uh, at what we can achieve from regional partnerships, including possibly with the state of Israel, if we agree on the right um, you know, pass uh, towards reconciliation and, and full normalization. And we look also as how we can benefit from this relation from an economic uh, point of view. Sudan's transition over the last few years was sparked as a result of popular demonstrations starting on or about December 2018. You've mentioned the key role that young people and women and activists are are playing in Sudan. Uh, Tell us more about that, because it's a a really amazing story uh, that's been happening and uh, and change is taking place. We've just been talking about uh, many of these uh, change-oriented issues and and this discussion here today. But how, in particular, do you see the role of of young people and activists and women uh, contributing to this transition that your country is uh, undergoing at this time? Yes, well, um, I see their role as being the builders of uh, the future of Sudan. We have to invest in our uh, our youth, uh, our younger generations. Um, We have uh, witnessed uh, the degree of uh, emancipation, the degree of awareness, of maturity, that they have, um, you know, um, uh, proven uh, throughout the change that uh, has taken place and is taking place now in Sudan. Uh, They are now open to the outside world. Uh, The last, uh, the past regime has done everything to isolate them, Uh, but uh, they found their ways and means of opening up to the world and understanding that the future of Sudan is in linking up with the world community and in espousing uh, the changes that are happening uh, in IT, in technology, uh, in issues of human rights and issues of building democratic and open uh, societies led by the civil society. Uh, We have, Sudan has proved that it has a vibrant civil society contrary to what people thought in the past. Uh, and this uh, civil society uh, is playing its role. 
uh, all we are doing now uh, is in order to uh, give, him, give them the key to the future and enable them uh, to carry uh, the tasks uh, that are uh, put on their shoulders uh, of uh, uh, better organizing themselves, uh, better educating themselves, raising their capacity in order to be able to achieve uh, the major tasks that are waiting them ahead. So it's about opening up to the world, opening up to the future, uh, and uh, building their capacity uh, in order, in a, I would say, in a, an orderly manner, uh, so as to be able to contribute politically, uh, socially, uh, and intellectually uh, to rebuilding Sudan. Ambassador, thank you for taking the time today. It's been a pleasure talking with you about developments in Sudan and the region and wishing you and all friends in Sudan a uh, blessed and peaceful Ramadan. Thank you very much, Mr. Paraziliti, to you and to the monitor and wish you well. And, uh, and I wish a peaceful Ramadan uh, to uh, the whole of the Muslim world and the world at large. Thank you very much. We will return after this break. I'm Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor veteran columnist reporting from Israel, one of the world's major news and action suppliers of all times, comparing to its tiny size. I've been covering and analyzing the political, diplomatic, and military arenas in Israel for over 34 years. My best-selling biography, The Netanyahu Years, was out two years ago. I covered seven prime ministers, one major war, two intifadas, one prime minister's assassination, two and a half peace treaties, four military operations in Gaza, and it's not letting up anytime soon. I am glad to invite you to On Israel, our brand new podcast, where we will discuss major events in Israel and its surroundings, talk to decision makers, leaders and analysts, and try to understand the chaos that comes with the territory of Israel and the Middle East. You will never have a dull moment with us. See you soon here on Israel Al Monitor. Thanks again to our guest today, Ambassador Nuruddin Sati, and to our production team of Phil Calabro of Al Monitor and Beowulf Rashland of Two Square Media Productions. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will return next week. And in the meantime, please sign up for this and our other El Monitor podcast on Israel at your favorite podcast platform.